This is the Serrano Brothers Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we have the Reverend Becca Davis on our podcast. Uh, Becca, I'm so glad to see you. Um, Likewise. We know Becca... <laughs> We know Becca by way of the Sierra Pacific Synod. Uh, she was serving her first call in St. Mark's in San Francisco as an associate pastor. Um, and then she moved to St. Mark's in Pleasant Hill and then has since moved to Cairo, Egypt. Uh, we met Becca at first call theological education and we were having breakfast and you were having breakfast with your mother, Joyce. And we said, hey, why don't we have breakfast together? Uh, by the way, we love you, Joyce. I hope you're listening to this um, because yes, we, we love you so much. We love you, Joyce. <laughs> I 100% guarantee she is listening. <laughs> uh, Becca, we want to start off by just getting to know you a little bit better and having people get to know you a little bit better. So, you know, childhood, do you have any like favorite childhood memory that you'd like to share? I had a fantastic horse named Skipper, and people who have known me since childhood know that there's a fascinating correlation between the number of characters on the TV show Gilligan's Island and the number of pets I have had named after characters on Gilligan's Island. And uh, Skipper was the first of all of my childhood and adult pets named after those characters. Um, but honestly, I, I feel like I had a blissful childhood in Nebraska that was shaped by the freedom of having uh, a trustworthy horse. And I miss that. I miss that as an adult, even though I, I can still go horseback riding when I want to. I, I honestly don't take advantage of doing that as much as I can. But when I do, it's definitely a tie back to Nebraska. Mm. Uh, uh, do, do you Did you ever do any kind of sports with horse riding or did you did you just have a horse and like ride well i was in 4-h okay and i feel like you have some insider information on me um, no yes. no not at all i don't remember i don't remember <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm not i'm not trying to bring out anything i was just i just i i did barrel racing as a kid and oh. i loved it um you are looking at Oh, I'm, I'm searching for the year, but uh, Box Butte County Best in Show in 4-H, and I don't often mention that. This is officially the first podcast I have ever shared that tidbit of information. You well, heard it first here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to out you, but so you like you like really rode horses. Then this wasn't just like yeah. a like you really rode. You you're a rider. Yeah, that's Very really cool. cool. And you're and you're a lifelong animal lover. Uh, too. And, and the reason that I know like the deep love that you have for animals is because you tried to convince my brother and I to smuggle dogs to the United States uh, uh, from Mexico City. And, and this, is, uh, this is when I really do like, oh, she's like serious about her love for all animals. Like when you tried to get us to do that. <laughs> now, to be fair, for your listeners, it's important to know that there is a very legal, standardized way for people to help assist animals who, who were former street animals in Mexico to come have a new life in the US. There are some wonderful and reputable rescue groups. And if anyone is traveling to Mexico and is willing to partner with one of the organizations, uh, the idea is that in some US states, Adoption rates are so high, which is a great thing, that there's a higher need for pets. And um, I think we have Bob Barker, the, the late Bob Barker, uh, to thank for changing American uh, cultural perception about adopting dogs as opposed to getting a dog from a breeder. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for that because there are some fantastic uh, cats and dogs and other animals in shelters just longing for a good home. And so I don't at all want to overlook the fact that many shelters in the US are overcrowded, don't have high adoption rates. Um, but for the places that do, which I'm grateful for, uh, sometimes there are those partnerships with groups in Mexico. 
And uh, yes, I am going to hold you to it one of these days <laughs> that uh, I think I think the Serrano twins have it in them to bring back a dog from Mexico. I mean, <laughs> OK, here's OK, my honest goal, my honest goal. I'm going to just lay it out there for you. So you didn't know this, but I actually was looking for a litter of puppies so that it could it could be like twin dogs with twin brothers. Uh, and the rescue, group, <laughs> the rescue group that I was working with did not have any puppies at the time, therefore no no twin brothers to follow you. I probably would have taken that home and not to whatever, <laughs> like, you exactly. would have likely, you would have had me. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you know us too well. Well, well, that's uh, a, that's a, a great um, uh, beginning point for this because, you know, St. Francis of Assisi is coming up the day of St. Yes. Francis, um, you know, who, who loved all animals um, and, and was one of the most spiritual people that, that, we follow right um and and so so uh, uh becca do you have um a spiritual discipline as a pastor as a christian that you cling to that you do find yourself coming back to regularly honestly walking for me is a form of a spiritual practice because i feel like so much of my life is lived in front of the screen Mm -hmm. And that makes amazing things possible. It makes something like getting to interact with the two of you possible despite a 10 hour time difference. That's amazing. If you think back to our lives 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. At the same time, um, all good things are good in smaller doses. And for me, I think recognizing that sometimes stepping away from the very technology that makes my life possible is really good for me. And I appreciate walking, not only as a spiritual discipline, but as a chance to just reset. Mm -hmm. And at times when there is a fur friend in my life, usually that fur friend is, is part and parcel of a walk. But I find that even when I'm just walking by myself, I notice things. And it's fitting to me that we're talking about St. Francis and walking because I think you notice creation. Like if I'm walking, I see things at a very different perspective than driving by them. Or um, I don't I don't bike ride in Cairo, but um, times in my life when I have been cycling, it doesn't compare. And so I think for me, it's important to do something that is consistent in terms of a spiritual practice, as opposed to something grandiose that maybe sounds great on paper, but but that I don't adhere to. Mm. Walking, I absolutely adhere to on a daily basis. And especially now in such a large city where a cacophony of noise is always around me, walking truly helps me recalibrate. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, how, how are you feeling you're acclimating to Cairo right now? It's a good question. Um, I arrived when it was still the thick of, of summer heat and it was hard. Um, I, I felt like I was melting every single day and that's not great, <laughs> but the weather's just now starting to turn a bit cooler and it's wonderful because um, at night you can actually have the windows open as opposed to the AC running and, and you hear different things. It gets back to nature in St. Francis. Uh, I actually can see bats flitting in between the mango trees. Uh, there are starlings that are darting and dive bombing and trying to catch mosquitoes. And you don't expect that in a vast metropolis like Cairo. And yet it's there. Huh. And maybe a good reminder for us that nature is always there. It's just sometimes as humans, we do too good of a job of crowding it out. Mm. Amen. Uh, I, yeah. yeah. So, so you move you moved to Cairo to uh, serve at St. Andrew's United Church. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And and part of that is, uh, what are your, uh, before we talk about stars, what are your duties as pastor for, for St. Andrew's? Yeah. So at St. Andrew's, it has a very interesting history. This was a congregation that had some roots in the Church of Scotland and ended up collaborating um, 
with another congregation to become St. Andrew's United Church. That's why the word united is, is in the name because Cairo has undergone a lot of changes in the previous decades. And one of the things that I treasure about its history is that around 1979, this congregation recognized that what they were doing was not going to continue to work. And I, I say this for all of your listeners, but especially for people who are part of a congregation that might feel like there's just one last person there to turn off the lights. This story about St. Andrews, I find truly compelling. They recognized that being a congregation geared towards English language expats, and by expats, that's just a term to mean people who have moved to another country by choice. So people who have moved maybe to work internationally or to be a student internationally, as opposed to a migrant or an asylum seeker or a refugee. That's the difference when I say an expat. And so this congregation uh, decided that they would start partnering with the very large refugee community that exists in Cairo and that even existed in 1979. And amazing things have happened since then. So here's how St. Andrews looks today. Um, at 10 a.m. on Friday, I'll explain my Friday in a second, there is an English language service that is truly a mix of humanity. It's around one third um, English, native English speakers uh, who are Western expats, around one third um, Arabic speaking Egyptians, and one third refugees many of whom speak English, but not as their first language. And so for me, when I'm giving the benediction at the very end of the service and I am looking out, I feel like it is the absolute best and fullest representation of humanity that I ever see in any mm. capacity of my life. And I love that. Yeah. Because if I'm honest with you, something that I think can be rare in American congregations is a, is a true mixing of people. Um, I think that for a variety of reasons that are, that are valid and, and complicated, some of our congregations can become a bit, um, a bit like a, 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 a mono, what's the word I'm looking for? A monochrome existence. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think no matter how long I'm at St. Andrews, it will continue to stun me at the end of the service to see that wonderful mix of people. Now, it doesn't mean that things are perfect. Like any congregation, um, there are ups and downs. Um, there are things that we have to work out. And there are things that don't always translate. And that's a, a learning edge for me to recognize what's working, what's not. But I think it is such a gift of the spirit that this group of people chooses to be community for each other. And I cherish that. I really think it's remarkable that there is this worshiping congregation in, St. Andrew, in Cairo at St. Andrews where people choose to come together despite their skin colors looking very different, despite not always sharing the same native language and frankly, despite not always even sharing the same stripe of Christianity, that the mm -hmm. bond that exists is a bond of community and solidarity. And my hope is that there can be more St. Andrews in the future and that more of our congregations will look like this. But I got away from your question. Your question was about my responsibilities there and I went on a whole tangent. Um, so my responsibilities for the congregation are are many. The reason why St. Andrews worships on Friday is because in Egypt, the secular work week is Sunday through Thursday. Hmm. And so for a lot of Christians, not just the folks at St. Andrews, if, if they want to be able to worship consistently, it means moving to Friday. Hmm. And so it, it's really interesting. It, it, and honestly, as fellow clergy, it messes with your head to need to have your sermon ready on right. Thursday night, yeah. um, I still sometimes have moments where Thursday rolls around and I realize, oh, I still have a little work to do. 
and um, it's it's going to be it's going to be something that I think will always be on my mind because of how ingrained Sunday worship is for me. But by having the service on Friday morning, we then have an opportunity to host other congregations on Friday, the latter part of Friday, and then on Saturday. So there are six other congregations that are partners with St. Andrews, and they worship in a variety of other languages. Uh, Dinka and Nuer are languages that are spoken in South Sudan. There's an Arabic language ministry that is geared towards uh, people under 25. Um, and in addition to that, there is an Amharic congregation uh, that worships in Amharic is a language spoken in Ethiopia. We also have another Arabic language ministry uh, that is on hold right now uh, as a clergy, clergy search is happening. But these partnerships are rich, they're complicated, and they're challenging. Because if I can speak frankly for a moment, my salary comes from the ELCA. And in, in mm. case some of your listeners are not familiar, that acronym stands for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. That is a progressive Protestant Christian denomination based in the US. Even though right now, my salary is uh, substantially lower than my ELCA colleagues in the US, it is vastly higher than the other pastors worshiping and, and leading worship at St. Andrews. And that's awkward. It's mm. really awkward. And it makes me think long and hard about the resources that I have, mm. the resources that my colleagues don't have, and what that means in terms of our solidarity together. Um, it's, it, it's very hard sometimes to know that there are things that are possible for me that are not possible for my colleagues. I don't have the solution to that. I don't, um, I'm no worthless having the solution to that, but I do think that is worth noting as one of the very real challenges of sharing in ministry and sharing a sanctuary with colleagues I respect, with colleagues I value. Um, but it's interesting because that disparity is an elephant in the room that I think I, it would behoove me to address that as I talk about the ministry that I share with these other, with these other pastors. Hmm. Thanks so, for sharing so, that. Yeah, that uh, um, that's a dynamic I I I would I could never have imagined. Uh, you know, um, in all the time we've talked about you doing this ministry, um, so that's 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 one part of your ministry in Cairo. And the other part is, is being the director, I don't know, of, of St. Andrew's Refugee Services. What's your title in that part? Or is it just... my, my official title is a chaplain to the executive leadership team for STARS, which um, thanks for seeing the acronym, uh, St. Andrew's Refugee Services. And this ties into what I was saying about uh, the organization in 1979. This congregation recognized that they had extremely valuable property in downtown Cairo. Now, for anyone who has stepped foot in Egypt, it's an experience mm -hmm. and it's dense. Uh, Cairo is one of the world's largest cities and space is at an absolute premium. And so for, for this congregation to take a leap of faith and say, we could be doing ministry with refugees who, who are living in Cairo and calling Cairo home. And something that I think is noteworthy is that a lot of the refugees served by STARS come from not only a myriad of countries, uh, but also a myriad of, of lived life experiences. And so at, at the present moment, the, the countries from where refugees are are fleeing include Yemen, Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Sudan. Um, did I mention Syria already? Syria is also in the mix. And there are smaller numbers from a few other countries as well. Uh, not to get down a rabbit hole in terms of technical differences, but uh, there are um, 
There are also migrants from Uganda and from Congo. Uh, the reason for, for not calling them refugees are some technical differences that are not really important for this podcast. But I mentioned this mix of humanity because you can imagine that with that many countries, languages, cultures, one of the joys and challenges with STARS is making sure that staff reflect the clients who are being served. Mm. And STARS is a refugee-led organization, which is tremendous and mm. rare. And so that means that leadership comes up from the refugee community. A lot of people enter STARS as a client, then they become a volunteer. And then from that pool of people, staffing um, is possible in terms of working their way up the organizational ladder. And uh, the, the executive leadership team at STARS is phenomenal because it represents the client body they serve. And there's something very powerful about seeing people who look like you. Mm -hmm. I think we, we don't talk about that as much as we should in the Lutheran church, that it's not just that we want our congregations and the, people's, the people in the pews um, to, to be a mix of humanity, but that there's something so deeply powerful about when you see a, a person in leadership who looks like you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I say this as much for adults as for kids. Kids deserve to see people who look like them at the pulpit and consecrating communion. And in the secular world, let's use stars in, as an example. When a child comes through the gates at the campus at St. Andrews, when they see a staff person who speaks their language, who looks like them, who understands their cultural references, it's like oxygen. Mm -hmm. It's life-giving for people to have those, those common bonds and to see not only that that person understands them, but to recognize that the person who is now the staff person actually went through a similar life experience. And I think that that does a world of good to help with resilience, especially for the really, really young refugees who are arriving, but also uh, to give them hope that there might be a, a position that they could later hold in life that is one of dignity, that provides an income. And when you think about the, the lived life experience of refugees, what's one of the first things that is taken from you? It's dignity. Don't we all long for dignity? Now, I'm going to segue to something that, that is about dignity, but it's, um, but it's a little bit delicate to talk about, which is for people who have gone through the refugee experience, there are many ways in which dignity can be taken from us, taken from refugees. I, I myself am not a refugee, so I shouldn't say taken from us. Um, but one of, those, one of those ways that dignity is often taken from people is sexual assault. And one of the programs that exists at STARS that I, I hope your listeners will pay extra special attention to what I'm about to say. There is a young mother's program at the Arnaimo campus. The Naimo campus is geared towards unaccompanied youth, meaning um, people who are refugees, but who are young people who have arrived in Egypt, um, either orphaned or with no family members physically with them in Egypt. Imagine how challenging it is to be a teenager on your own, trying to navigate a new existence because you had to flee your home country. For people who are female, one of, the, one of the horrifying realities is that often that means that they arrive in Cairo pregnant. And so one of the programs that exists at our Naimo campus is for young mothers. There is a nursery that allows, um, that allows these young girls to then attend classes and to participate in programs while having a safe place for their infants or their toddlers to be cared for while they try to regain their footing. It's hard. 
if I'm honest with you, I can't always pop into the nursery when I'm at the Nanaimo campus because it just tugs on my heartstrings in a way that I can't always bounce back from in a professional way and in a timely manner if there's something I'm needing to do or a meeting that I'm needing to attend. Now, why am I telling your listeners this? I am not trying to upset anyone's delicate internal balances and I'm not at all uh, wanting to make people uncomfortable. But I do think uh, my lovely fellow Americans sometimes have some navel-gazing tendencies. And maybe it's good for us sometimes to recognize that there are problems that are far more common outside of the U.S. that we don't talk about. Indeed. And I think that it's good sometimes to recognize um, there, there are things that we, uh, we can and should address that we should know about and that we, we can have a voice. And so I'm so proud of all of the campuses that exist in the STAR system, but especially, especially the NIMO campus that really targets young people to try to help them reestablish dignity uh, to finish their education, or if they're not able to finish their education, to help them find vocational programs and to do things so that they have the ability to sustain themselves in Egypt. The I, reason... I have... Oh, go ahead. Well, well I, I was going to say, you, you, you were talking about these campuses that, that uh, St. Andrew's Refugee Services has. Um, I, I have a confession in that when, when um, before I actually saw some of these sites, I kind of had this thought of refugees as kind of the the FEMA camps. Mm -hmm. Like I thought that's what we were going to visit, not recognizing that one of your buildings is like a giant apartment building. And and one of them is a, a church campus. And then I haven't seen, I didn't see, see the third one. And so these are like in the middle of cities yeah, uh, or the yeah. city and and, these refugees are integrated into society, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's not like out there in the FEMA camps, it's in the midst of where everybody's living. I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a, a hugely important thing for people to know that one of the reasons why Cairo is a city that many, many refugees, millions, literally millions of refugees gravitate towards is because in Egypt, refugees have freedom of movement. Um, mm. When you have registered with UNHCR, there are three classes of documents that you might receive, a yellow, a yellow card, a white paper, or a blue card. And I mention these because there's there are different levels of what that, of the freedoms that you have, but nonetheless, you have options if you are a refugee in Egypt that are vastly different than if you were a refugee in say, Kenya. So for example, um, a country like Kenya has a very different policy. Uh, it does have camps like um, Dadaab and um, uh, Kakuma, which do look like those classic FEMA style camps that you were describing, Jeremy, mm -hmm. where people are, are warehoused. It's, it's, um, it's dehumanizing. In Cairo, it's not to say that people's existence is easy. It's not, it's not at all. In fact, you often have young people, many young people sharing a tiny apartment and sleeping in shifts because it requires many, many young people all chipping in to cover one apartment rent. But nonetheless, uh, you're able to you're able to move about Cairo. Um, you're able to work under the table, um, and on top of that, you're you're simply able to have some freedoms that you don't necessarily have in other places. And that's why Cairo does not have quote unquote refugee camps, like as people picture those FEMA style camps that you were describing, um, and that is a tremendous thing. And it, it's no small thing because most 
most countries of the globe don't allow for that relatively um, unheard of freedom. Now, that being said, there are still, there are still challenges. It, it is not an easy existence by any stretch of the imagination, but that is one reason why Cairo becomes the focal point for people from all of those countries that I mentioned earlier, which are sort of on the periphery of Egypt. Um, but that is a hugely important thing, Jeremy, that I'm glad you brought up because many people, when I've talked with them about stars, have assumed that the clients were living in refugee camps and they're yeah, not. Yeah. Yeah, I was up until this moment. So thank you for sharing that. I uh, how, how many how many people does Stars serve? Stars serves around fifty thousand refugees. Um, now, oh. I I should get you more accurate numbers because right now with the crisis happening in Sudan, uh, which has been ongoing since April, uh, thousands of refugees are arriving on a weekly basis from Sudan. Uh, so our numbers are higher right now. Um, thanks to the ELCA, we have received some emergency funding that has helped with that added influx of people who are registering with STARS and with UNHCR. Um, by the way, UNHCR is an acronym that stands for United Nations High Commission for Refugees. Uh, it is an organization that, that gives those temporary documents so that refugees, um, if they are um, if they are stopped, for example, uh, by police, uh, can show the document to show that they are registered in terms of their refugee status in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, you, you said like there was a technical difference in, in what a refugee is besides, uh, as opposed to migrants, you know, um, what is, so what is a refugee then, you know, and, and, and what are the reasons that you're seeing people right now come to, to Cairo. And I'm sure there's, you said you serve so many people, but, but maybe just a few reasons why sure, people sure. are coming right now. Yeah, so right now our concurrent with this, this high number of refugees coming from Sudan, which has been since April in terms of the very high numbers, in parallel to that, the highest percentage of refugees that STARS serves are from Eritrea. And that's because Eritrea has a system of forced conscription for young people when they finish their education. Whether you finish because you've graduated or you finish because you're no longer able to keep going. And so it's, it's extremely challenging because families have the choice of sending their 16, 17, 18 year old child to the front lines or trying to assist their child in fleeing the country. And so what is, what is hard, especially with the, the very young people coming to our NIMO campus, you're trying to put yourself in the shoes of this young person or their parents. And it's such a different situation than anything that we face in the US. Um, and the reason for that conscription is something that people can, can Google on their own, um, but it's, it's a military conflict and it is, um, it is near certain death for the young people who are conscripted into the military. Mm. So our caseload is very high of Eritreans and making sure that young people are supported when they're here is, is it's important regardless of age, but especially if someone has had to make life choices that developmentally, they might not be prepared to fully cope with all of the difficulties that they face, um, leaving their homeland, leaving their families, um, and simply trying to continue to exist, like literally just trying to continue to have a heartbeat. And, <clears throat> To your question about what, what defines a refugee, um, a refugee is someone uh, who has fled their home country because of, of persecution or the threat of persecution, generally uh, by the hands of the government. So that is different than uh, someone who has fled their home country, often for equally horrific reasons, uh, but perhaps in other situations because the person is queer 
um, or a variety of reasons that might not be directly on account of the government, but on account of society. So that's mm. one of the primary differences between a refugee versus someone who is um, uh, seeking asylum, but as a migrant. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, are are you um, sorry? I, I lost the question <laughs> that I was going to ask as a follow up. So, um, do you have any stories? Can you tell us a story of somebody from that you're serving? that you have permission to share? <laughs> sure, I, I, I don't exactly have permission to share this, but, um, but, but you'll understand when I finish the story why I'm able to share it. So I mentioned the Naimo campus. Naimo was a young woman um, who was one of the clients in the unaccompanied minors program. And when you think about people who have a spark for life, there continues to be a framed photograph um, on the wall at the Naimo Center celebrating her birthday. And it literally says, happy birthday, Naimo. Hmm. And one of the staff members is hugging her. Many of us have heard about the sheer number of people trying to enter Europe. And, and we see these atrocious images of massively overloaded boats mm -hmm. filled with black and brown people trying to reach Europe. Why are they trying to reach Europe? They're trying to reach Europe because the chances of legal resettlement to North America or to another country in Europe is something that less than 1% of our clients ever have the chance for. Mm. Very few countries are asking for more refugees. Um, even the programs that exist are oversubscribed. There are very long wait lists. The chance of a refugee actually being resettled in an official legal capacity is like winning the lottery. The chances are extremely small. So what does that mean? It means that most refugees who arrive in Cairo will die in Cairo. And that comes with living an existence where you never have the chance to gain citizenship. You're working under the table and you have the challenges of trying to find healthcare on your own, of um, perhaps difficulties of registering your child's birth, mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just to be able to acknowledge that you've given birth. And that leads to desperation. And that leads to people wanting, the, again, the dignity of being able to marry who they want, of having a career, of maybe being able to attend university and graduate from university. And we live in a world of have and have nots. I mentioned a few minutes ago about the massive difference between my colleagues in the US and the salary that I used to earn the salary I'm now earning, and you won't even be able to see my hand because my hand is just hovering above the floor of the salary that my colleagues earn. People long for dignity. And if that means achieving it in ways that are outside of our standardized legal system, hope is a powerful thing. Mm. And so Naimo, young as she was, looked at her options of what it would mean if she remained in Egypt. And so she was one of these people who tried to, to cross the Mediterranean on a massively overloaded boat. And she tragically was one of the people whose boat sank. And what we should know is that there are groups trying to help refugees crossing the Mediterranean but there are also a lot of groups actively turning those boats away, even when they're overcrowded, even when they're sinking. And it's really hard to know that some of the clients who I have grown 
to care for and to love will inevitably die crossing the Mediterranean. The numbers of people starved serves are so high that statistically people will continue to try to keep crossing. There will be more Naimos. And when you think about the young people in your life and what you would do to try to keep their hopes and their dreams alive, it's really hard to know that the difference between Naimo and kids we love and care about in the US is simply the country in which they were born. That's really all it comes down to. None of us have yeah. any control over the passport that we have in life. And yet so often the narratives that we have it in our discourse make it seem like we have somehow done something to earn the passport on which we travel. There is no fundamental difference between Naimo and Cademan and L and any of the young people in our lives. Yep. Oh. These are beloved children of God. The only difference is the spot on the planet to which they were born. And I hope for people who quickly jump to speaking of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants as though they're not human, could really understand that the same God who lovingly made them made you. If we could remember that, if we could really embrace that, I think the world would, would be a very different place. But we want and we cling to what we think is ours and what we deserve. And that's true of resources, that's true of salaries, that's true of so many things. We, we have this inherent fear that if we actually start sharing things with people, <clears throat> that we will somehow have less. Yeah. We lose sight of, of the generative capacity, not only of God in our midst, but of what can, what can be possible financially when we actually share even just a tiny amount. I, I think that's a great segue into how can people support STARS? A wonderful way to support STARS is financially. Um, if people go um, and, and Google STARS Egypt refugees, you'll, you'll find the website. There are there are many ways in which people can donate financially um, for people in the US. There are organizations that allow you to get uh, the IRS tax deduction for people in Europe. Uh, we have a branch called STARS Austria that is a supporting main. And most importantly, I think people can also read more about STARS. It's, it's I've only scratched the surface. Yeah. There, there are more programs, there are more amazing stories about this organization. Um, and I, I hope that people will take the time to learn more about it online. But I would also encourage people to come visit, truly come visit. And I'm, I'm going to give my email address, oh boy, um, in the hopes that if people do have questions that they'll reach out directly. My email address is my name, Becca, dot, davis at elca.org and i do think that seeing is believing there's something about the zeal of the convert once people have a chance to actually experience stars there are so many different ways not only that people can volunteer uh, but even just become aware and so i genuinely want people to know that if you write to me and you have questions, um, I'll do my best to get you the information that you would like. And that if people are interested in, in coming to Egypt for some type of a visit in the capacity that I can, I would be more than happy to help facilitate that. I, I do think that the groups who I have had come visit come away with a a truly enlarged perspective of what it means to be 
part of God's creation. It's powerful to see, to see the hope, the dignity, uh, and the encouragement of not only the staff at STARS who are refugees themselves, but the clients. And, and to know that something powerful happens when we share the gift of our time with each other. And, and Becca, I, can, I, uh, I can hype you up, Becca, because I went on one of your trips to Cairo. And, and you survived. And, and, I, and, and I had honestly never uh, really even thought about traveling to Egypt. Um, my own kind of perceptions of, of Egypt, you know, kind of kept me from that. But I knew you and I knew, um, um, I knew that you would do everything well and, and keep us safe. Cause that was a big concern of mine. And, and the way that you led that trip, um, and the way that you put refugees on the bus with us for a day um, was um, it was masterful, and and Cairo will always have a special place in my heart um, be, because of that trip um, that I got to go on with my wife. Um, it was um, it was truly a, a magnificent experience, and if and if you are a person who thinks. Um, oh, you know, I, I just don't have any interest in that. We had on our trip, women who were close to 90 years old doing everything that we did. And, and it, it was just absolutely wonderful and truly life-changing, especially seeing the STARS program, yeah. which is why I wanted you to come on here. Yeah. Becca, I just wanted to thank you so much for for what you said. It took me a second to recover emotionally because I don't know. I started. Uh, I was just really moved by everything that you've said. So so just thank you for that. Um, as kind of we we close in, we close out our time. We we like to ask all of our guests uh, uh, kind of these rapid fire questions at the yes. end. All right, are you and ready so, for it? I'm ready, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Uh, Becca, which food can you eat every day? Dorothy Lynch salad dressing. What's your favorite movie genre? Genre? Oh, I'm a nerd. I love documentaries. Salty, sweet, or savory? Salty. Ooh, mm, salty, savory, Venn diagram. Okay. In addition to the Bible, because most of our guests say Bible, um, which book would you take with you on a deserted island? Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak. <laughs> Speaks to my heart. What fills your cup? Dogs. Lovable dogs. What depletes your cup? Mm. I was about to say a word that I then realized I'm on a podcast, right? Um, cynicism. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite holy place? Oh. My mom's hug. What is a good piece of advice that you've been given? Ah, uh, look before you leap. What does rest look like for you? A long nap. And on that last day when you enter into heaven, what do you hope that God will say to you? Here is the cast of Gilligan's Island in animal form waiting for you. Everybody, this has been the Reverend Becca Davis. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you. I miss you both so much. This has been the Serrano Brothers Podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>